with Sam Cedar. It's time to look in the mirror, America. Do you like what you see? I keep referring to Obama as the magic Negro. Do you like what you see now? Well, suck on this. It's just a mirror, America. Shared sacrifice by everybody. What could it do to you except reflect your image? I did nothing wrong at the Minneapolis airport. The Majority Report. Far more credible to me than PBS. And Frontline. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> if I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, September 26, 2017. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the four-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live. Steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, professor of public policy and economics at Stony Brook University, Stephanie Kelton. On how can we pay for all this? And modern monetary theory. Also on the program today, Repeal and Replace dies again, but it's not dead yet. And next up, tax cuts for the rich, but be, shh, be quiet about that. Be quiet about that last part. Meanwhile, Republicans introduced the Dreamers Bill, known as the Tear Families Apart Act of 2017. New studies show Wisconsin voter ID law kept at least 17,000 voters from voting and locked them up. At least six White House advisors used private emails. Oh, my God. Start the, start the hearings. New travel ban, more or less same as the old ban, appears to get SCOTUS sanction, at least for the time being. Puerto Rico may see some help. North Korea asserts Trump has declared war on them. And Alabama about to elect a lunatic. All this and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yes, now... The idea behind having uh, Stephanie Kelton on, and she was on this program uh, back in 2012. And um, if you remember, you can easily search our archives on the app and uh, find that interview. You can uh, search it other places as well. We're going to try not to be too redundant with the interview. But much of what we've seen, and last night there was a debate between Lindsey Graham and that creepy guy Cassidy and Bernie Sanders and... Uh, Klobuchar from uh, Minnesota, and the debate was ostensibly between the Republican plan to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act uh, and the Affordable Care Act itself and the concept of Medicare for all. The big question, the reason why some people feel like Medicare for all is a fantasy, is because of the cost. The big issue that we're going to be dealing with over the next couple of weeks, maybe months, will be tax cuts for the rich. Now, oddly enough, the repeal and replace bill, Graham Cassidy, cuts a trillion dollars from Medicaid as of the year 2026, 10 years out. And just coincidentally, the... Tax plan being floated around by Republicans and promoted by Donald Trump cuts a trillion dollars worth of taxes, 50 percent of which go to the top one percent in this country. Here is Jake Tapper talking to Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, reminding him of what Steve Mnuchin had said about their tax plans. It's not all going to go to the rich out uh, a tax plan on Wednesday. Uh, Axios is reporting that the plan uh, would cut the tax rate paid by the wealthy Americans 
uh, from almost 40 percent to about 35 percent, as well as making dramatic reductions on taxes on big businesses, small businesses. When you were selected as Treasury Secretary, you made a very specific promise. It was quickly dubbed the Mnuchin Rule. Take a listen. Any reductions we have in upper income taxes will be offset by less deductions so that there will be no tax, absolute tax cut for the upper class. Can you reaffirm that pledge that there will be, quote, no absolute tax cut for the upper class? Is the Mnuchin rule still in effect? I, I did say that, and I just want to clarify. It was never a promise or it was never a pledge. What it was, and it is still, it was what the president's objective was. Hey, what happened? It was aspirational. You know, like around the office when I say it's payday, that doesn't mean I'm going to pay you. It means it's a day that I hope you get paid. I certainly hope I don't have STDs. <laughs> I always put a rider in my, when I'm purchasing a wife, I say, yeah, I mean, I would really like to think that I don't have herpes. It's <laughs> uh, that really. I see, and if anything, I if like, I do give you herpes, I'll offset it with a government subsidized vacation. I love, I, I love the fact that he said, I did say that. <laughs> After being played the videotape of him saying that. Like, I'd just like <clears throat> to confirm that, that, that is, video you played of me is absolutely accurate. It literally did happen. But, you know, it's like, a, it's like someone staying in their homes with a mortgage I've sold them. I'd like to think they could stay in. Here's the dilemma the Republicans are going to have on this tax bill. Their agenda is to cut taxes for the wealthy, despite the fact of the Steve Mnuchin rule, which has now been amended. They want to cut at least a half a trillion dollars from the tax bills of the top 1% in this country. The top 1%. They know in this environment, they cannot say that. They can't even sell the idea of trickle-down economics anymore. It has failed miserably in Kansas. We talked about Arthur Laffer, who's now a joke by anybody who, who has any sense of what's going on in this country. They know they can't, they can't sell it unless they pretend it's not tax cuts for the rich. And so they've got a real problem. Steve Mnuchin not helping that problem by putting a little, well, actually a massive asterisk on his Mnuchin rule. In fact, one that covers out, uh, blots out the word rule and Mnuchin. <laughs> so uh, they've got a big problem. But this is why we're going to want to talk to uh, Stephanie Kelton about this, because the real question is, is how do you deal with questions of the deficit when the deficit may not matter? And why might not the deficit matter? And why, in fact, can we pay for things even if we don't have the money today. We'll get to that when we get to Stephanie Kelton. But first, let me tell you, you spend a third of your life in your sheets. Are they taking care of you the way they should be? Introducing Brooklinen.com, high-quality sheets and bedding at a price that won't keep you up at night. Founded in April 2014, Brooklinen offers simple, beautiful home essentials without the luxury price fastest growing bedding brand in the world i slept on a, a set last night the gray pinstripe ones and now we get like huge pads so that saul doesn't pee on them and he did not pee last night people love these products their sheets have over 12,000 five-star reviews plus they have versatile colors and patterns that complement any decor this is luxury bedding underpriced you have to have these sheets today. Believe me. I'm telling you, they honestly. I love my Brooklyn and sheets. You I can attest, you do rave about them. I had one set of sheets that had little um sheep on them. And I had those for twenty years. And when they Lord. ripped, because after twenty years, your sheets just rip you don't have to do anything to rip them. They just rip. I have been searching around for sheets that I love, and now I've found them. Get 20 bucks off and free shipping when you use the promo code MAJORITY at brooklinen.com. In fact, Brooklinen is so confident you're going to love their new sheets. They offer a 60-day, or I should say 60-night, 
risk-free satisfaction guarantee and a lifetime warranty on all their sheets and comforters. There's no reasons not to give this sheets a try. Only way to get 20 bucks off and free shipping, use the promo code MAJORITY at brooklinen.com. That's brook, B-R-O-O-K, linen, L-I-N-E-N.com, promo code MAJORITY. These are the best sheets ever. All right, quick break. When we come back, Stephanie Kelton. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program Professor of Public Policy and Economics at Stony Brook University, Stephanie Kelton. Welcome to the program, uh, Stephanie. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So, okay, um, we're we're speaking, uh, a, 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 I guess, a, a couple of days after a uh, major modern monetary theory conference. Uh, we are speaking sort of, I guess, on... One of the days that the repeal and replace has died, it may die again uh, soon, and we're ramping up for uh, a a major attempt to cut the taxes of wealthy people in this country. So I thought it would be a great time uh, to have you back on the program. You were last on, I guess, really uh, four or five years ago now, I think it was, Um, and I want you to, I mean, in a nutshell, I don't want to get, I don't want to cover too much of the ground that we covered before, but, um, you know, for people who don't know what modern monetary theory is, um, explain to them what it is, but let's start with Brenton Woods in 1971 and the change that happened then. Okay, sure. Uh, so Brenton Woods is a place in New Hampshire where an important meeting took place after World War II to talk about um, how to restructure the international monetary system to provide some stability uh, after the war. And what came out of that meeting was a decision to, um, to fix countries' exchange rates. In other words, a way to tie their currencies all together and keep the prices at which currencies trade one for the other at a fixed rate. So 44 countries come together and 43 of them agree to fix the value of their currencies to the U.S. dollar. And then the U.S. being the 44th country agrees to convert its currency, the dollar, into gold at a fixed price. And so it was a a form of a gold standard uh, monetary system. And the idea being that uh, this way we can have a sense of of what things are going to cost. I mean, things aren't going to be wild, change wildly in price from day to day, essentially. Yeah, I mean, it's especially important, they thought, after the war, when countries were going to need to um, rebuild their economies, especially those that were most war-torn, uh, and that this would give them some... Um, you know, certainty about exactly how much things were going to cost because they were going to be buying a lot of things that were produced here in the U.S. This is back in the day when the U.S. ran trade surpluses and we were producing a lot of capital equipment and other sorts of things for the rest of the world while they, you know, repaired their economies after the war. And so this gave them uh, a sense of certainty about exactly how much things were going to cost. So the world operated under this system for about 25 years. And then and then what happened? Yeah, we were on and off gold standard uh, for much of our history, as were other countries. You always go off of the gold standard, though, when you have a crisis. And so the U.S. went off the gold standard during World War I and again uh, during World War II. And then at, uh, in the early 1970s, 
President Nixon announced that he was taking the U.S. off the gold standard and putting us on what's known as just a purely flexible floating exchange rate. So now the value of the dollar floats against most other uh, countries' currencies, except those that choose to fix their currency to the dollar. So we have a floating rate currency. And what, why that matters is that it opens up policy space that you don't have when you're on a gold standard. If you've got a monetary system that's tied to something that's finite, that there's only a limited amount of, then you play by a different set of rules than you do when you move to a monetary system, a type of arrangement where there's much more flexibility. And it gives you a lot more flexibility in the policy uh, space as well. And, 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 and that's why when we were facing a crisis where we needed more money, we would go off the gold standard. Well, yeah. And, and I would even maybe say a little differently. It's not... I wouldn't maybe say we needed more money, but we needed to be able to spend big. And you couldn't do that if you were, if you had a system that was tied to something finite, you got to take off the handcuffs. So we took off the golden handcuffs. And why did, uh, why did uh, uh, Nixon decide to do this? Uh, Why was there a push to do this in in, uh, the early seventies? Well, there are a, a lot of reasons, and some are sort of geopolitical. I mean, there were it became contentious, different countries because of the implications for trade. And if your exchange rate can't adjust to allow a country that's running persistent trade surpluses and, and have that country's uh, currency get weaker and weaker to help make their goods, uh, I'm sorry, if, if countries running persistent trade surpluses, then, you know, the other countries in the world are running these big trade deficits and they go, hey, that's not fair. Uh, Your country's currency is too cheap. You ought to allow your country, uh, your currency to appreciate, get stronger so that your goods aren't so cheap and give give us a shot. And so there were big fights that took place. There were inflation implications, but mostly it had to do with uh, trade imbalances. Okay, so now we found ourselves in a um, a new era where we're untethered from gold and uh, modern monetary theory, if I'm not mistaken, argues that, um, or I guess implicit in it, is that we haven't quite adjusted the way that we perceive money and the way that our, uh, our fiscal policy hasn't quite adjusted to this new reality. I think that's exactly right. I think that um, behaviorally, we and policymakers and even many academics and you know political pundits they're still trapped in this framework this mental state of mind where money is a real thing and so you'll hear people like hillary clinton during the campaign and she'd say things like you have to find the money you've got to go where the money is and you need to find the money well that sort of suggests that we're lifting couch cushions and poking around for you know coins or something, that, that there's money that's, that's, quote, there somewhere, and you have to go and get it. And it, it's almost as if we think it's, it's under the ground, and we've got to dig it up, you know, that we haven't quite made the connection to what a modern money really is all about. Well, okay, so, so once we're untethered from a, um, a commodity, essentially, like gold, I guess, mm-hmm. um, that has a finite... Uh, of which there's a finite amount of, um, money is not really paper dollars per se, right? Money is, what is money? (laughs) Well, money in the modern era doesn't, we shouldn't be thinking of it as a physical thing. So take, for example, the, the decision last week, right? In the, in the Senate, your listeners probably, uh, heard about this. The Senate voted to, um, to dump a huge sum of money into the military budget, Mm -hmm. make far more than even the White House was requesting, and they voted to spend $700 billion on the military. Okay. Right. I think they wanted $54 billion more, and the Senate gave them like $80 billion more. Gave them $80 billion more. Yeah, they said, no, 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 that's not it. Take more. And then in addition to that, they authorized the production of something like 94 new F-3 jets, you know, two dozen more than the Pentagon, Pentagon had requested. So it was just like, you know, take, take $700 uh, billion. We'll give you more than you even asked for. And, you know, 89 senators stood up and voted for this legislation. Now, where do they get the money to do that? And the answer is they didn't get it from anywhere. The money will be created as a result of the vote. 
So it's the congressional authorization to spend that triggers a whole bunch of payments that are now going to be made out of the Treasury's account to sellers in the defense and contracting industry and so forth and so on. So where does that money come from? Ben Bernanke has been pretty candid about this. Now, he was the Fed chair before Janet Yellen, and he was asked in a sit-down interview with Scott Pelley, hey, is that taxpayer money the government is spending? And Bernanke's response, I'll give you the exact quote, he said, it's not taxpayer money. He said, these banks have accounts at the Fed, and when we spend money, we just change the numbers up in their accounts. <laughs> wow, you know, that was pretty, that was pretty candid. Um, and so what he's saying is, the government gives us instructions, and they tell us we're going to spend money on X, Y, and Z. And our job is to go out and make those payments on behalf of the federal government. So we change numbers in balance sheet. We change numbers in someone's account up. You spend another, you know, $40 billion on something, we put the $40 billion in someone's account. It's not a physical transfer of cash. It's an electronic spreadsheet entry. How is it different from credit? I mean, how is that concept different from me going to, uh, you know, uh, the Gap and uh, buying a new shirt and mm -hmm. saying, like, here's a piece of plastic. Um, I'm right. paying you with that plastic. How is that different? How is but it different not. from credit? Right. I mean, yeah. I'm not giving yeah. them so, anything. I'm just, yeah, yeah. here, so, here's this. So look, at, is, look at my plastic. It's different. it's different because what you're doing is you're, you're telling the gap that Visa is intervening on your behalf, that Visa is going to handle the payment. And so what you're showing them is something that they trust, the Visa, the MasterCard, whatever the case may be. And the gap is saying, okay, that's cool. We know that we're going to get paid, so we're going to let you walk out the door without tackling you when you leave with your shirt. And so, but you haven't paid for the shirt at that point. You've substituted a third party obligation, and you said they're going to handle the payment. But they're not finished with you, right? Because at some point you're going to go to the mailbox and you're going to find a little envelope in there, and Visa's come knocking at your door. And what does Visa want? They want you to pay for the shirt. And so, you know, you're probably going to pull out a checkbook. Maybe you're going to have an electronic payment. You'll go to your computer and, and take care of it. But maybe let's say you write a check. And so, you know, you sit down, you fill out your check, you put it in the mail. Visa opens up the envelope, and there's a check from Sam Seder. I say, oh, this is great. Look at that beautiful signature. We're just going to hang on to this check because that's all we need from Sam. No, Visa's going to cash the check. And what happens when Visa cashes the check is they get government money. That's the end form of payment. It's the final means of payment. So when the government is paying for the military spending we just talked about, it's already making a final payment. It's paying with its own dollars. So you can't do that, and I can't do that, and poor Puerto Rico can't do that because they can't muster up dollars out of thin air. The federal government of the United States is different. It's given unto itself the exclusive right to create the U.S. dollar. There's not an entity on earth other than the federal government, who can create the dollars. That's where they come from, and that's why they can never run out, and it's why they get to play by a different set of rules. They're not like a household or private business. So when uh, we're told that um, if they cut taxes um, according to the plan that, um, that the president is promoting and that Paul Ryan is promoting, it will add a trillion dollars to the deficit. When we are told if uh, we go and um, uh, provide uh, Medicare for all or even Medicare for the people uh, who, uh, you know, are 65 and older at one point, it's going to uh, blow a hole in our deficit, in our debt. What I mean, what not that wh why is that not like uh, I owe this money to a visa? Okay, so, well, a couple of things. Let's make sure just so that all the people who are listening are clear on what that means to say that there's a deficit. So if the government, let's take the first example, where we have these huge tax cuts, most of which go to those who are already at the very top of the income ladder. And government says, we're not going to collect as much money uh, from you as we used to. We're going to take less away from you. Okay, that's the tax cut. And so as a result, the government's books are going to show you know, fewer credits coming into them. And the non-government, the private sector, is going to keep more dollars. So we say, let's say the government deficit increases. Another way to say that is to say the private sector surplus increases. They have to keep more of, of their, their dollars, right? 
So what's the risk in that? What is the government on the hook for? And the answer is nothing. Now, in the U.S. right now, if the government, do the other example, Medicare or something, increases payments on something, and that results in a bigger deficit. So let's say the government spends 100 into the economy, but it only taxes back 90. Okay, we label that a deficit. We say the government has run a deficit, but it has left $10 in the economy that wasn't there before. Now, the, the result of running the deficit right now in the U.S. is Congress requires itself to borrow. So whenever I run a deficit, I force myself to sell treasury bonds, and that's called borrowing. And whenever I sell bonds, the debt increases. Okay, so what happens is I spend 100 into the economy, I collect 90 back out in taxes, I left behind 10, and now I wave around this thing called a U.S. bond, government bond. Now, the bond offers interest. So somebody out there in the economy is sitting there holding 10 U.S. dollars that don't pay any interest. So the government says, who wants to buy the bond? And, you know, people say, oh, I do, I do. I want that interest-bearing thing because, you know, I'm going to make money off of that. And so they swap their $10 for the U.S. Treasury. Now they have a bond. And so we say the government is now, quote, in debt. Right. Right. And every single treasury bond that's out there being held is somebody's asset. But it's on the liability side for the government. So we say the government is, quote, in debt. But we often forget that all of those treasury bonds are the assets that are being held in pensions and other portfolios all throughout the economy. So the, I, I guess the question you're asking is, does that matter or is that like using a credit card? When you use your credit card, maybe you charge it up and you get to a point where you go to the mailbox and the bill is there and you don't have the cash. You can't pay. Right. Your, your account doesn't have enough money. You're in trouble. Okay? You may miss a payment and then your credit score may go down. Then you may have trouble getting credit and borrowing later on in life. That doesn't happen to the federal government of the United States because all it's doing is promising to do what? To take that treasury bond back from you in the future and swap it for dollars again. Uh, can that be risky? Can it ever find itself in a situation where it can't make a payment in U.S. dollars? Of course not, because we just said the federal government has the exclusive right to create the dollar. It can never run out or be forced to miss a payment. It can't turn into Greece. We don't depend on China. I mean, all of those things that we hear all the time are just fundamentally uh, in incorrect. Okay, so... Uh, we've walked through that dynamic where the United States has the ability to uh, always to provide dollars for people who call in their so-called debts. Uh, but what about, uh, I, I mean, and we don't hear this quite as much as we did uh, five years ago when we were talking about this or even uh, six or seven years ago. Well, I was told by now we would be Weimar Germany and that uh, when I go down to get my sandwich, it's going to cost me seventy five dollars to buy like, you know, a loaf of bread or something. Um, mm. w why didn't that happen? And why won't it happen if we behave or have the understanding that you are suggesting? OK, so, well, why why wouldn't something like that happen? What you're describing a hyperinflationary scenario. I think what a lot of people were worried about uh, four or five years ago, six maybe years ago, was what the Fed was doing. Not so much what Congress was doing, although maybe some of that, because deficits got really big in the wake of the uh, financial crisis during the recession. I mean, we had trillion dollar deficits, which are uh, more than double the normal size of the public sector deficit. So maybe people were concerned about the size of the deficit causing inflation. But there was also a lot of concern, you remember, about what the Fed was doing, all that quantitative easing, and people were calling Bernanke helicopter Ben, and in, there were cartoons of money being dropped from the sky, and this was all supposed to lead to massive inflation. So um, I guess there are a couple of ways to think about it. One is, uh, what causes inflation in the economy? The U.S. just has not experienced any kind of serious inflation since really the 1970s. And globally, what countries are struggling with right now is not any kind of inflationary pressure, but all across the world, governments are struggling to just keep inflation in positive territory, in other words, to avoid deflation. And so inflation remains very, very low in spite of the fact that governments ran these big deficits and you had all these central banks doing quantitative easing and other sorts of things, printing money, so to speak. So if we can't get inflation up and central bankers have been very frustrated, 
you know, at their inability to get inflation up to their 2% target even, then one question is maybe it's just not that easy to generate inflation. I mean, if it were that easy to do, surely we would have been successful by now. I mean, $3.5 trillion increase in the Fed's balance sheet and so forth. So I don't think it's all that easy. And I think inflation is one of these phenomena that economists do not understand very well. The last time we had significant inflation in the U.S., uh, again, was in the 70s, and we had oil price shocks. Yes. So, you know, that kind of thing is easier to understand. But just running an economy um, at full employment, taking advantage of the policy space you have, and trying to use the government's budget to achieve broader objectives in the economy like full employment isn't going to get you inflation problems. And so the idea, I mean, as I understood the, the fear at that time was um, the Fed was essentially, you know, creating money out of thin air, uh, which is, I, I don't know how else you would do it, really. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, uh, but... Uh, they were creating money out of thin air, just like you would suggest that, um, you know, Congress created money out of thin air when they voted to um, raise the uh, the military budget by 80 billion dollars. Um, it's not like anybody went into, you know, uh, in, into the bowels of the Senate and started with a pickaxe and started, you know, pulling this stuff out. Um, and the idea is that, I mean, th that fear, as I understand it, is that our monetary policy would create inflation as opposed to sort of like um, the, uh, the, the market where you have, you know, oil shocks and you have uh, a, a, a tremendous a demand that outstrips the supply. And all of a sudden mm -hmm. people are paying more for something and that's driving inflation. So mm -hmm. so if it's the case that. Um, we can't it's extremely difficult to create inflation or maybe impossible unless i guess you're just not paying attention uh to create inflation by simply paying the government paying for something uh by creating money out of thin air why why do we need to sell federal government bonds why do uh we need to collect taxes why don't we just pay for things well, I guess the first one I'll answer is, why do we need to collect taxes? Why don't we just pay for things? Who would work or produce and transfer real resources, their own labor, their own materials? You know, who would make things and sell them to government in order to get dollars if they didn't know that they needed the dollars for some reason? So in other words, what I'm saying is, the reason that the dollar is the dominant financial instrument in the U.S. economy is because it's the means by which the government spends, uh, pays for the things it buys and collects money from people in the form of taxes. So, you know, in another country, in Japan, it's the yen. Why isn't it the dollar? Why isn't it the dollar in Japan? Because the Japanese government makes all of its payments in yen and collects taxes in yen. If you eliminate the tax then you eliminate the demand for the currency in the private sector. Why would people be willing to work and produce to get this worthless piece of paper or you know, spreadsheet entry in their bank account? We need, we've got it backwards. We, we think of the government as needing our money. So you always hear people talk about taxpayer money. You've got to find the money. We think they need to come to us and collect dollars that they can then turn around and spend. It's exactly backwards they've got the, the power of the purse. They've got the monopoly on the dollar, and it's us, the people, who are subject to a variety of taxes in our everyday life. You couldn't get you know, from home to work without being confronted with some type of tax, whether it's you know, putting gas in the car or stopping in for a cup of coffee. You're going you're gonna to need to pay a tax, and all of those taxes are denominated in dollars. So we need their money. They don't need ours. It's it's completely backwards. And why do we borrow? That's a good question. Let me just say, let me just uh, interject one thing on that tax thing. Yeah. David Graeber tells this story quite well, I think, in, in, in his book Debt from uh, several years ago. Uh, and how, you know, when uh, the Roman armies would go into an area, they would introduce the currency and say, we're, we're, this has value to you because we're going to, f to take it in taxes. Uh, so you will you you begin to use it as an exchange because it essentially is allows you and I'm not uh, advocating imperialism here, but it allows us to pay the dues 
to basically be part of this society, essentially. And it's, yeah. it's the only thing we're yeah. taking. You, you know, it's not puka beads. If you go down to, you know, the all-inclusive resort, uh, they have their own currency there uh, because that's what they'll take as like a tax for the rum drinks you're drinking or whatever it is. Uh, and it's basically the same situation here. This is what we accept in this uh, in this society. It's the dues you pay for society, and that gives it its value. That, that was very well said. That's that's. I should have said it that way. That was perfect. Well, and it, I got that from David Graber. But so okay. Well, so why do we why do we uh, why do we issue federal government bonds? Well, that's a, I said that's a good question. I mean, it it made sense before the Fed was doing what it's doing now. What it's doing now is paying interest on uh, reserve balances, the the accounts that banks keep at the Fed. So the Fed has this idea that it prefers to have interest rates above zero. It wants positive interest rates. And so right now it just uh, achieves that goal by announcing the amount of interest that it's going to pay on the accounts that all these member banks keep with the Fed. So if they want interest rates at a half a percentage point, they just pay a half a percentage point on the excess reserve balances. If they want to go up to 75 basis points or three quarters of a percent, they pay more. If they want to go to 1%, they pay one. In the old days, they didn't do that. And they were kind of one of the few central banks that wasn't uh, paying interest on reserves. They were using this old-fashioned technique called open market operations. I'm not going to bore listeners, but basically what, what it involved was buying and selling government bonds in order to add and take away reserves in order to hit their interest rate targets. So the bonds were important because they were a tool that the Fed used to conduct monetary policy. They don't need that tool anymore. They just do it directly by announcing the interest rate and changing what they pay. So the, the important role of government bonds is gone now. Now you say, well, are there other, do bonds play other roles? And yeah, they do. I mean, I'm sort of torn on this one. Some of my colleagues in the MMT community, the other scholars, uh, have advocated for just stopping altogether, not issuing another U.S. Treasury ever again. Just spend the money into the economy, tax some of it back out, and leave the difference sitting there. And let the Fed pay the interest. Right now, it's Treasury who pays the interest. And that, like, fires up everybody in Washington. They're all obsessed with the line item of the budget called interest on the debt because they think that the bigger that gets, the less room they have to spend on other things. And it drives them crazy. And so, you know, you might say, well, don't issue bonds. And then once you retire all the outstanding debt, you won't have any interest on the debt. And then you don't have to worry about it. Uh, I don't know. I'm not quite there yet, I think. I feel like, you know, government securities are such an important, safe asset in the global financial system that I just haven't convinced myself that it would be okay um, so in other words, eliminate them. OK. And yeah. So let me just so in, in your mind, uh, the, the bonds actually serve a different function, which has less to do with the government being able to spend, which has nothing to do with the government being able to spend, mm -hmm. but has to do with just providing um, a safe harbor for people in times of uh, economic turmoil, uh, because it, it, it is it is a, a, such a rock solid place. It's it's like. Why do we need a bank? Well, because people feel comfortable if there's a big uh, iron door there and protecting stuff. Um, yeah, and you can diversify. You know, you have this risk-free asset that pays you some interest, and you're not even taking risk, which, by the way, is one of the criticisms. Why should the government be paying interest to people who hold treasuries, mostly the wealthy, you know, right. uh, who aren't even taking any risk? But, of course, there are lots of treasuries and pensions and, and other types of places, too, so that's kind of where I come down sort of, struggling to pick a side okay now um you've got to go uh teach in a few minutes um yeah. other people aside from us but let me so let me ask you this there's two there's two questions that i you know and maybe we we need to do this uh, again as as an amendment to this but who needs to understand this and in whose interest is it to not understand this in other words, do we really because like I find myself like I've been aware of, of this theory and I it, it makes sense to me. But I find that even as I talk about this stuff on a day to day basis, it's like that's not an argument I want to have to reintroduce every time I talk about this stuff. Um, but who really needs to understand it? I mean, if 
if the government one time, one new government came in and understood this theory and just behaved in that manner and nothing happened for long enough, would that be enough? Right? Because everybody's kicked the can down the road and fixed the debt and all these groups that I heard about three years ago, they've all seemed to have disappeared. No one's worried about the deficit or the debt anymore. Um, Who's interested in not understanding this and who really at the end of the day needs to understand it for us to actually provide our citizens with what we want? Well, I think, you know, there are probably a lot of people in whose interest it is to have, you know, this not well understood. And I'll just pick one. uh, And that would be, you know, the Pete Pearson uh, Institute. And so there are people out there like this billionaire guy who founded the Peterson Institute, but then also has under that umbrella, literally hundreds of other organizations. You mentioned Fix the Debt. That's one of his that are running around trying to persuade voters, uh, you know, people that the U.S. has an unsustainable uh, fiscal situation, that we're going broke, that uh, Social Security and Medicare are the biggest drivers of the debt crisis, and that we've got to make changes today. You said kick the can. Their, their whole purpose is to say we can't afford to wait. They create a sense of urgency. And so the, the picture has to be really dire. And they haven't given up. I mean, you may not hear as much about it today, you know, now that the Republicans control right. everything. But they are still after Social Security. They're still after Medicare. And the debt crisis, they believe, is the surest way to get there. You persuade people that there is no alternative and you make cuts today to deal with this phony crisis. I mean, but the thing is, is like, are they going to enrich themselves if we don't have Social Security? Oh, sure. I mean, as major employers all across the country contributing 6.2 percent of payroll to Social Security and and Medicare and addition, you know, this yeah, it, this is a huge form of a tax cut for them. Absolutely. Because um, and 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 they can't they can't adopt the posture of like we could just pay for Social Security. Uh, and you don't have to tax us anymore because, of course, we need taxes to maintain the value of our currency. Right, right. No, they'd rather see it privatized and and then stop their contribution altogether. And we should also say it's also taxation is another way also of making sure that you have uh, wealth. Uh, you know, some you don't have obscene wealth inequality. Um, mm-hmm. Right. All right. Well, OK. Uh, I know you've got to run and uh, and 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 I still have uh, more questions, but I think this is a lot for people to digest today. So the, the bottom line is when we hear that we can't afford things like Medicare for all, the reality is we can. We just have to decide that we want to make that political choice. That's right. Congress just has to authorize the spending just like it did with 700 billion for the military last week. Stephanie Kelton. Uh, where can people get more information on modern monetary theory if they want to learn more about this? Well, they could go to Amazon and Google those words. There are uh, books available there. There's a website, a blog called New Economic Perspectives. They could check that out. Great. We'll link to, uh, to, to that at majority.fm. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Sam. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. I did it. How I got her out by 1245. Um, so let me, you know, How are we that? she had to go uh, teach uh, because she's a professor and other people need to know about this, uh, this stuff. But the, the, the bottom line here, and I hope this was we weren't going too quickly. I wanted to sort of just lay this out here. I can tell you that in 2011, I think it was, maybe it was 2010, I would regularly go on. Um, oh, gosh, now I've forgotten his name. Who was that dude whose show I used to go on to on MSNBC who uh, had the big explosion on to and he's now off of MS. He was a, a, a finance reporter and uh, Jenks friends with him. What? No, not Dobbs. It no, was. Uh, not oh, gosh, Dobbs. I can't That's remember that. Guy's oh, name. oh, I know who you're talking about. Uh, the guy with the curly hair. Dilly Radigan. Dylan Radigan. So I would be I was a regular on Dylan Radigan's show. And at one point they had David Stockman on. And David Stockman was the budget director for Ronald Reagan, I believe. And he was, I don't know if he was on Pete Peterson's payroll. If I had to bet, I would say it was. But I would also say he was a little bit um, odd 
And he, at that time, I can't remember what some he was saying. He was coming on. PIMCO, the biggest holder of bonds in the U.S., one of the biggest uh, hedge funds. Or the number two at PIMCO has just sold their bonds. And we're going to have a massive crash in the summer. And it's going to be because of these bonds. And we're going to go bankrupt. And this country is going to go bankrupt. And he was 100% wrong. We had a guy on this program called Bush and Chains, who we don't hear from that much anymore, who was insisting we needed to get gold because our currency was going to... If only... only had a problem with the idea that deficits don't matter. If only he could do economics as well as he does music. Indeed. Shame. And... Uh, this has been the, the rallying cry for people who want to cut things like Social Security and whatnot. Because we do need taxes, but we don't need them to fund the government. We need them to be confixatory. We need them so that we don't have massive wealth inequality. And we need them so that we maintain the value of our currency. And, and this is also why we need, to my libertarian friends, the monopolization of force by our government to put you in a cage. As I have been told, has been uh, said to me by libertarians, to put you in a cage if you don't pay taxes. That's correct. That's why your money has value. Because if somebody wasn't going to come to you and say, we're going to put you in a cage if you don't pay your taxes, then the dollars wouldn't really have any value. Why would they? You are a madman and very evil. <laughs> we cannot and so quantify freedom. we need taxes to provide value for our money. We need taxes to keep Wealth inequality in check. Our taxes are too low. Remember, for the greater part of the biggest expansion in our economy in this country, in fact, for the entire, uh, the entirety of that, every dollar you made over what would be in today's dollars, somewhere around $3 million, was taxed anywhere from a 70 to a 90% rate. Every dollar above that. We had estate taxes to make sure that wealth was not concentrated in, in small amount of hands. Small number of hands. And maybe in the context of uh, Trump, it would be a small, small hands. I, I work that in. I work that in. And, but the reality is, is that we can spend on Medicaid, on Medicare, on Medicare for all. We can spend. We can spend as much as the government wants to spend. Lindsay was all over that last night. And it, it, when the beginning it would be, you know, actually we're going to take care of you just as well. It's just going to be better spent and people who are local to you care about you better and all that <laughs> nonsense is amazing in the context of American history to, that you could say that with a straight face. But then... After the debunks happened, and Bernie said, what's the most popular, you know, we'll play it later, Medicare's the most popular health care program in the country, then it just came down to Lindsey Graham, you know, we're all going to die, basically, just the version of there's going to be a major economic collapse, and you could, you could have a Medicaid for all card, but it'll just be a card and no care. That's right. And this is the, all the argument she's talking about. And... The reality is, is that we're just still stuck on this idea. And, 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 and really, I think the reason why we're stuck on this is partly tradition. But I think part of it is that there have been hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of millions of dollars spent. I mean, if you don't know the name Pete Peterson, maybe we should just do a show about Pete Peterson. Yeah. He was Nixon's, I think, Treasury Secretary. And then he went on to make a ton of cash at uh, a hedge fund, I believe it was. And this guy 
has made it his life's work. And I can tell you this, that you have the amount of people that you have read about, heard about, seen on television, reporters who have gone to functions put on by the Pete Peterson Foundation in some form or another would blow your mind. I would say the majority of people, if you listen to a normal amount of NPR, cable television, network television, read articles in the paper, the majority of people <laughs> that you uh, consume or the, the majority of the information you consume, those people, the majority of those people have in some way attended been paid, got a fellowship from Pete Peterson Foundation. It is it is stunning. It's stunning. I'm not saying they're all, you know, uh, shilling for Pete Peterson, but they just spread that money around it's so far It's ironically a very and easy way to make a living and a great social safety net for pontificators. Right. It's pretty amazing. Um, it's one of the easiest hustles in the world. So, and then you know the dilemma that I didn't get into, um, uh, and this is for another day with uh, Stephanie Kelton. And maybe we can talk to some other MMT people about this. Is you know the one that I have every day, where, and sometimes I think you probably heard me say, like uh, I'll say this is going to add to the deficit, but that really it doesn't matter. But that is an issue that we hear Republicans talk about. I will I will drop it in here or there, because. The other dilemma is, like, who do you need to have believe this? The concept is hard to wrap your mind around because of the way that we've all been taught. The way that we, it's very hard for us to conceive of money as not being what it's like in our households. Not being what it's like in our check, checking account or in our credit card account. We don't have the ability to create our own money. And, you know, the only thing you could probably do is like we used to hand out to uh, Mila when she was a kid tickets for her to be able to watch TV. And um, you could create, I guess, in your own household, a system like that where it's like I, I can I can make as many tickets as I want. Then I'm going to tax you to take some back. And maybe I'll give you another way of earning tickets. You can earn tickets by doing some work around here. And you regulate the number of tickets that she has. And I can create as many as I want. And if I see that she's watching too much TV, I pull back on the tickets. I take a tax. I don't know if that's um, that works out in the same fashion, but it's an important concept to understand. And I still haven't quite worked out who it is needs to understand this within the context of our government. What is the minimum number of people? Does it have to be the citizenry? Can it just be a president? Can it be a treasury secretary? Can it be a, a couple of senators? I mean, do they all understand it when they vote $80 billion to add to the biggest military times X? In the world? Do they all need to understand modern monetary theory to make that vote? I don't know. All right, we're going to take a quick break. And, uh, folks, this show does not have the ability to print its own currency. <laughs> and while I try and convince Matt and Michael that payday is an aspirational uh, concept, not a pledge or a promise. It's what it's an intention and it's a hope. You know, in some ways, <laughs> when you look at what is actually given to us, the message is coming across. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hope. It's a hope. Agreed. Yeah. And I hope that I can <laughs> literally physically survive <laughs> on what you eke out for us. There you go. So, folks. Help me in my aspiration. It's an inequality <laughs> crisis. Here, get your tokens for crumbs. Uh, 
by becoming a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. Jointhemajorityreport.com. Uh, pennies a day will support this program. Um, and as a way of saying thank you, we give you bonus content. Um, we give you bonus content uh, and um, what else? Well, we give you uh, archive features and tons of stuff like that. Also, uh, don't forget tonight, Too Much BS is happening. That's right. Uh, the Michael Brooks Show, you can watch live on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Sam Cedar. We got to come up with a, a link for that. Yep. Majority, yep. you know what it should be? It should be like Majority Live, and that should just go right there. Right. Or something like that. That's smart. Uh, Corey Pine and uh, Matt Crisman. Corey Crisman. Corey Pine. Corey Crime, Pat Crisman. <laughs> what? I don't know. I just did one of those things. Like Norm Cosby. <laughs> it, I, didn't, I didn't mean to, but it was oh, coming you really out. didn't mean to do that? No. Okay. I did the second time. Uh, Corey Pine and... Uh, Matt, Matt Crisman. Matt Crisman from Chapo. Chapo, Chapo yes. Trap House. Um, all right, folks. Uh... Don't forget, uh, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. And uh, we'll be right back in the fun half. We are back. <laughs> Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. Very you know, heavily. Fun half. Very heavily. Fun half. Uh, Where the remix so, is at? So yesterday, yesterday, uh, as you know, the CBO came out with a preliminary score of the Graham Cassidy destroy your health care bill. Uh, the CBO didn't have the ability to do, um, to predict all of it. It's very difficult because, you know, you have to remember here, the bill basically says we're going to let the states do whatever they want. All the thing we can tell you is that 
it, by 2026, we'll have cut a trillion dollars out of the trajectory of Medicaid as it is now. And then after that, who knows? Because each state will do whatever they're going to do. CBO uh, decide, uh, basically said that um, it would cause millions of Americans to lose insurance and would lessen the federal deficit by $133 billion. Remember, remember that number, a trillion dollars, because you're going to hear that there's a trillion dollars worth of tax cuts coming down the pike. Once that CBO number came out, Susan Collins said she's definitely not signing on to this. And between John McCain and Rand Paul and perhaps Lisa Murkowski, everyone said that the Graham-Cassidy bill was dead. I don't know if I believe it or not, but I also don't believe it was just a question of the CBO. Here are protests that were taking place in the Senate chambers, there are, uh, these are activists from the group uh, ADAPT. They are uh, activists, and they were incredibly active the last round in which uh, the skinny repeal was destroyed. Um, these are activists uh, with people who are physically challenged in some fashion. And it is pretty incredible stuff where you see um, some of these activists being pulled out of the Senate chambers. Um, we have two clips here. One is from uh, Vox's Jeff Stein, who was on the program the other day. Uh, another who was just up on a Twitter feed. Here, here it is. It was, um, I believe it was a woman being w wheeled out on her wheelchair, um, screaming about the cuts. Here are more um, activists. I'm not sure from which group these guys are, folks are. Uh, but here's uh, more clips of that. Save our liberty! No cuts to Medicaid! Save our liberty! They're um, pulling a uh, a blind man, dragging him out. Um, and you know these folks depend on Medicaid. They depend on it, uh, its services, and um, you know, uh, incredibly uh, brave folks who are saving healthcare for mil literally millions of people in the country. Um, last night on CNN, there was a debate. Some of the air was let out of the tire because it appeared that uh, Graham Cassidy was dead in the water. And then uh, Graham and Cassidy showed up and they appeared to be somewhat uh, pretty close to death in the water, <laughs> to frankly. Uh, just the image of, I mean, I saw these two guys sitting next to Bernie Sanders and Amy Klobuchar, who, um, I mean, presumably Bernie's older than those other two guys. But they look old. He has a lot more vitality. He really does. He has a lot more vitality. And, and I think I mean I mean she uh, looks like she's in her twenties relative to everybody yes. else on that stage. And he and Cassidy's only like fifty nine. Like wow. I mean, Graham might be, you know, pushing his late sixties, but Cassidy's a pretty young guy, relatively speaking. Um and here is a moment and uh, look. I you know I didn't watch this enough to get a real sense of, like, who won this debate. I mean, obviously, I'm a little bit biased. But you got to ask yourself, like, who is this debate really for? I would find it hard to believe that there's many people watching this who 
were actually on the fence as to whether or not they should support Graham Cassidy or not. I think this is about trying to mainstream the idea of Medicare for all. And if that is the real agenda here, and I'm not saying it's the agenda of the people who are on stage. I'm just saying from the perspective of like what this could actually do, it could either legitimize the Medicare for all idea, proposal, or it could undercut it. And I think it was also important, to, you know, we're protecting the Affordable Care Act. But let's face it, that battle's over. <laughs> There's 20 percent approval rating for the Graham Cassidy thing. People don't want the Affordable Care Act to be repealed and replaced with anything that the Republicans are offering. And so if you're assessing whether or not this helped Medicare for all become a more mainstream idea. And by mainstream, I'm not talking about the general population because the general population, to the extent that they're asked a question and it, uh, you know, it doesn't go too deep, um, they're broadly in favor of it. But in terms of like the establishment, the press, to accept the idea that this is actually like legit I think it just helps having Amy Klobuchar sitting next to Bernie Sanders, frankly. And, you know, someone who's not associated with uh, being a socialist and, uh, you know, for 30 years or whatnot, just sitting there, you know, basically lending support to the idea just by her presence. A real Democrat? Yeah. I mean, a, you know, pretty mainstream. Midwest. You know, yeah. Minnesota. Uh, yeah. Coming from a, you know, uh, bluish, but not, you know, maybe a bluish. It's a bluish state, but it is a state that purpley sends, state. you know, Bachman to Congress. I mean, and Minnesota Norm has Coleman. Some, I mean, it's yeah, yeah. so very extreme. So uh, but here is Bernie uh, basically <laughs> um, schooling Cassidy and Graham about what is and what is not popular with the American public. <laughs> now, I, I would just, first of all, when you ask the American people about whether or not they like Obamacare compared to your plan, overwhelmingly the American people like the Affordable Care Act. How many people know second who of all, one second, are? One second. Second of all, pause it, it for one second. Pa pause it for one second. So his argument is they don't know anything about it. They don't know who I am. They don't know who Cassidy is. They just know the Republicans are coming for your health care. <laughs> the more they, they found know. out about just how delectable the both of us are and how we just want to just, 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 just nibble around the edges a little bit about you dying from cancer maybe a couple years earlier or something. I, I, I would say, look, as, like someone, uh, as someone who has, uh, you know, involved in communications, I think it's probably a net positive that they don't have a good sense of who's pushing this. Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe if you'd like more if I was Persian or something, Sam Cedar, G liberal. How many people know second who of all, one second, are? One second. Second of all, it is easy to beat up on big, bad federal government. Guys, do you know what the most popular health insurance program in America is? It's not the private insurance Medicare. industry. It is Medicare. Medicare, yeah. <laughs> Which is falling and apart. <laughs> Senator Cassidy and I are both on the Veterans Committee. Go out and talk to veterans. And what the polls show is that veterans are very, very positive toward the VA. Does it have problems? God knows it does. But veterans feel very good about it. It facts is the second most popular health care program in the country. Okay? So the point is, it's easy to say Obamacare isn't perfect. Everybody knows that. But the truth is that what people in this country see is a health insurance mm. system designed to make insurance companies and drug companies huge profits. They want a cost-effective system that, in fact, deals with the needs of our people and not just the CEOs of large corporations. And that is why I personally believe, yeah, that if Medicare is working well for seniors right now, we can make it work for every man, woman, and child in this country through a Medicare for All program. We actually. 
There you go. And uh, Lindsey Graham and, and, and Cassidy are both sort of, they're a little bit flummoxed. I mean, and, and, and part of the reason why they're so flummoxed is that they've set this up. The, the, problem, the problem that the Republicans have had since day one of this attempt to repeal and replace Obamacare is that their criticism has all been from the left. Their criticism has all been from the left of where Obamacare is. But their solutions are all from the right. And they cannot square those, that circle. And here is Lindsey Graham, again, attacking our health system from the left. A little more FaceTime. I think he'll do wonders for the numbers the, on Graham Cassidy. Jay, the, by the way, can I also the, just say... Well, let me just finish this. Yeah, the sorry, problem sorry. is, Lindsey Graham is saying that there are middlemen involved <laughs> in our process. There are people taking profit out of a system that shouldn't be profiteered upon. Those those parasitic health insurance <laughs> companies. I wrote a whole gosh darn bill to... Well, never mind. Those uh, parasitic <laughs> health care companies. I mean, honestly. <laughs> honestly. Also, does if, anybody if, get I more mean, TV time other than John McCain than Lindsey Graham? Right. I think like, if anybody knows politics, they know this fucking guy. Of course. But, I mean, if I was just to say to you, like, Lindsey Graham is going to make his argument for Republican health care reform by demonizing health insurance uh, companies, you go, what? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, right. It doesn't. Hey, what's happened since Obamacare passed? Anybody have stock in Anthem? These are the big blues. Four, 270% increase. Humana, 420% increase. Uh, Aetna. 470% increase. Cigna, 480% increase. Where's the money going? It's going to insurance companies who are not delivering for you. We had five insurance companies in South Carolina. We're down to one. And Amy, what I'm not going to do is take more taxpayer dollars and give it to a bunch of insurance companies. Here that's right. Great. So you're Don't co signing do on Medicare for All? And that's why I'm announcing now I'll be co sponsoring the Medicare for All bill that uh, you uh, have introduced, uh, Senator Sanders. I mean, they, there's nowhere for them to go with their critiques. The they, American people are so stupid. Bill's going to write a bill. We must stop lining the pockets of private insurance companies which is why we are advocating cutting a trillion dollars from the government-provided Medicaid. It doesn't make sense. And letting private insurance companies discriminate against people with pre-existing conditions right. again. Right, and then we're going to make uh, insurance even more profitable for them. Because I'm just so goddamn angry. I'm the Cesar Chavez of South Carolina. <laughs> All right. Um, Karl Marx, the hillbillies. I just get so let's mad go to the when I the anthem numbers. <laughs> you call him from a 508 area code. Who's this? Where are you call him from? 508? 508? Hello? 508? Yes, who are you calling Hello? from? Hello, who's this? Oh, hey. Hey, this is Ryan from Worcester. How's it going? Ryan from Worcester. You're the second person I've talked to from Worcester in... Two days. Ooh, anybody important? Mm, well, I don't know. I don't, uh, you know, I'm not going to divulge that kind of information, Ryan. <laughs> That's fair enough. People are from um, Worcester. Yeah, so How important you. can they really be? I mean, let's be honest. Where are you, are you from Worcester, oh. or are you just going to school there? Uh, you know, born and raised, and I did go to school here, too. Oh. There you go. There you go. So suck it up, Western Mass. All right. <laughs> What's might. up, Ryan? <laughs> And so, first of all, I just want to say, like, that was an awesome interview earlier. I'm still, like, digesting it. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things. And, yeah, I definitely foresee the framing of that argument in the future to be a challenge to those that are wrapped up in our traditional understanding of what money is. Yep. But primarily I want to call to chime in on everybody's favorite topic of identity politics, which I'm sure you're so excited to hear about. Um, the I've, I've heard some very interesting framings of the discussion on the show uh, from Michael originally actually did a really good job framing the dumb, dumb arguments on both sides. 
and then on on the Michael Brooks show, he like recharacterized it as like a Marxism versus intersectional uh, sort of debate, and I thought that that was like not quite accurate. And as a Marxist, I kind of wanted to like give that perspective on identity politics and sort of apply it to the Democratic Party. Okay. The um, yeah. Firstly, I would say like if people want to hear a more in depth and contextual version of this argument. Um, if you look up Marxism and the fight for black freedom, it's a pamphlet that we put out as a socialist alternative on our website for free to get a lot of good stuff in it. But that said, um, historically, capitalism and the socioeconomic systems prior to it, like feudalism, monarchy, etc., they all kind of were built upon the exploitation and the subjugation of the powerless by the powerful and that tie of power has been inextricably tied to wealth, whether it be uh, land, human chattel, uh, material possessions, etc. And so when a Marxist says, like, oppression operates primarily across uh, along class lines, like, that's what they're referring to. But if you stop there as a Marxist, and I argue you're a dumb, dumb Marxist, because you can't and let's move this to the context of the U.S., the oppressed class is would be the working class, and it is not a monolith. It's full of various identity groups um, by you know, race, gender, sexual identification, etc. And they are all oppre- oppressed by a ruling class, but how that oppression manifests itself is different across those different identity groups. And that's what's really important that the the dumb dumb Marx argument of this uh, doesn't take into account account that um, when we talk about uh, we don't have to divorce uh, identity from economics like a caller yesterday I think sort of kind of hinted towards right uh, you know and ending the drug war is a good thing for everyone in the country except for uh, a handful of elites but it disproportionately helps people of color and like that's not a bad thing we should embrace that. And you can't talk about leading the movement if, insofar that the Democrats are willing to do so uh, for the liberation of marginalized groups or working people in general without talking about the other. And when we talk about the Democrats, they what worries me about them, and you know, as a socialist, I don't have a lot of faith in them, but you know, insofar that they're willing to help us out uh, – they like to, uh, them, in addition to their right, but they do it from a completely different side, uh, adopt that language of identity politics because it serves as a good way to garner like shallow support for mediocre reform, as well as we see from Hillary Clinton, a convenient deflection for like more legitimate criticisms. But what we need to see from them is, like even one step beyond rhetoric if we go to policy, I can have this terrible picture in my head of Kamala Harris getting the Democratic nomination and then her bold uh, reform and with regards to identity would be like commissioning uh, the creation of like 20 privately owned uh, African-American banks. Right. And like that sound that sounds nice along those lines of identity. It's like, yeah, black capitalism, like uh, we're promoting those who are worse off in our society. Like, yeah, but it's not doing anything to fundamentally change this the systems that create this oppression in the first place. So we can't be talking about that. We should be talking about, you know, radically reforming uh, our police uh, system, having democratically uh, elected like citizen review boards for cops. It, it doesn't on its face. It doesn't sound anything uh, related to any particular identity group, but it does have that uh, disproportional effect on those groups. And I think like that's the direction we need to be going and, we can't just say like Democrats forget about identity politics because if you're not intersectional, then like you're just not fighting towards the left at all. And, and I think also, you know, I mean, just to add to that list of like, you know, things uh, that uh, more federal funding, maybe more uh, state funding uh, and, and decoupling education funding from property taxes would be another one of those uh, uh, type of issues. Um, uh, Worcester I, I, representing. I, I I like the way you laid that out a lot. Uh, could you say maybe one more time how we could find the pamphlet? Sure. Um, if you uh, Google, like, uh, so it's on our website, socialistalternative.org. 
But if you just Google socialist alternative and then Marxism fight for black freedom, uh, that should lead you right there. Great. Uh, I'll tell you what my politics are. What's the rules? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Ben. I appreciate hey, the call. You thanks, city Ryan. Council. Yeah, maybe. Have a good one. Hi, you know, I'm Sam Cena. Uh, I'm coming back. I'll home. tell you, uh, I'm running for city council. Not for nothing, but Joe Joe O'Brien is he is he running? Is he mayor again? No, he's not mayor again. He he toyed with the idea of running again or running for city council, but ultimately decided to drop out. Mm. Socialist alternative candidate. No, but he he worked for Jim McGovern. Oh, he's no. a good guy. Jim McGovern's Definitely a good not. congressman. No. Uh, <laughs> like not, he no, he's nope, not. Definitely. No, he's not. I'm, I mean, it's it's Worcester. But uh, Joe and I went to high school together. We were uh, we were on the front page of the Worcester Telegram Gazette with a Charter Commission proposal, but that, that's for another day. We were stable mates in a certain <laughs> sense. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to go too deep. Joe into, and I were stable mates, but he's a good guy. But he wanted to run, but he decided not to run in a certain <laughs> sense. <laughs> I was just talking about that Charter Commission proposal the other day. It comes up whenever I meet anybody from Worcester. Of course it does. But of course, everybody I'm talking to doesn't exactly, wasn't born. It doesn't exactly they come up. They weren't born. They just say They it. weren't born. They weren't even born at the time. I was working on a charter commission proposal, and I'm telling people who weren't even born. God. Moving folks, along. Folks, you know, often when people drop out of presidential races, you think to yourself, God. I'm never going to see that guy again. That's too bad because he was such a lunatic. He was fun uh, to watch. Well, Rick Santorum is one of those people. And apparently he's back on the scene claiming that he wrote Graham Cassidy very possibly. And here he is doing his best to pretend that Graham Cassidy does not roll back the federal requirement that insurance companies cannot or prohibits uh, insurance companies from denying you coverage if you have pre, uh, pre-existing condition. Not makes it affordable, not adequate, blah, blah, blah. Not mushy, mealy things. The bottom line is you cannot sell insurance if you don't uh, provide for pre-existing condition, if you don't, um, if you in any way prohibit people with pre-existing from conditions from buying your insurance. Period. End of story. That's it. And here is uh, Rick Santorum trying to argue with uh, Kathleen Sebelius that the bill actually doesn't say that. That's why we moved bill. away. Yeah, the I ACA that. was about insuring outcomes. I understand Not that, just pricing. I you're understand. Taking and that for the away. first time, let me, let me actually say, forcing let me, let me companies to, you, to compete me, about service right, right. and me, price, not yeah. about who they could cherry pick right. the market, who could drive yeah. out the sickest but people, Graham who Cassidy, could make as, money. As you well know, Ms. Madam Secretary, Graham Cassidy does make sure that pre- people with pre existing conditions are covered. Absolutely yes, not true. I wrote the bill, Madam Secretary. I know what's Congratulations, but it actually allows. Let me, let me tell you. To go back to let me tell underwriting. you. Let me tell you exactly what it says. It says that every insurance company under Graham Cassidy has to cover people with pre-existing condition. Every state can they has charge to, them a lot more? Ha, ha, can they price well, them out of the market? You, you, you know what? Uh, the, the reality is that the state can get a waiver, just like, by the way, they can under to Obamacare. Put in different risk excuse pools. me, That's Madam Secretary, if you allow me to finish. Under Obamacare, there's a 13, thir- there's a there's a waiver process in Obamacare that allows people to get waivers. Now, no state has done it, but you you can get waivers under Obamacare. We so, provide. Rick, just to be sit- clear, Rick, is your answer yes to that question? Yes. They can underwrite it the way they want. They can charge people with pre-existing conditions what they want. Is the the answer yes? The the state has to get a waiver, just like they do under Obamacare, but they have to get a waiver from the secretary. But right now, you can't price it the way you want. Correct. Let me let me finish. But it matters. You got to answer the question, bud. I am answering the question. You're not giving me the chance to answer it. It's a yes no answer. Well, it's not a yes no answer. Under both laws, the states can get a waiver 
on the on the issue of pre-existing condition. That's and under ours, if it says you get a waiver, then you have to show the secretary that you can uh, you're providing affordable and accessible insurance. Kathleen, so, how is it different so than what now? So the answer is well, yes, the they waiver, will get affordable insurance. The senator affordable is not the same as it is now. Go ahead, Kathleen. Well, and the and the senator is just wrong. The waiver that is in the current Affordable Care Act says if a state can figure out a way to insure as many people and to keep prices adequate, they can use the federal money in various ways to provide that's that exactly, insurance. But that's they, exactly no, what we do Senator, under this you bill. said they could in waive fact, they could waive pre existing conditions. That's I, absolutely they false. Have that to is guarantee absolute, people with pre existing condition no. affordable and accessible. And insurance. they have to offer a package of benefits uh, that guarantees if you are sick you will have the medical care you need. That's right. And under the Graham Cassidy running, bill waives uh, allows true. states to waive the essential health benefits and allow that states is, to put people true. in they risk. They could put that in their plan, that but as you know, Madam totally Secretary, undermines no, it doesn't the uh, totally pre-existing condition. It. I Look at poor Chris Cuomo just sitting there like, uh. Look, um, Rick Santorum can't talk over me right now, so I'm going to tell you why he's lying. Or why he's, he's not lying. He's trying to cloud the picture. The Affordable Care Act allows all sorts of waivers where a state can figure out different ways with the exchanges or they can do um, private, public, uh, whatnot. But the bottom line is none of that has anything to do with the one thing they cannot waive. And you cannot waive the requirement that insurance companies insure, insure, not offer at an adequate price, some vague number, blah, blah, blah. No. You must insure people with pre-existing conditions. That's off the table. You cannot sell insurance unless you offer it to people with pre-existing conditions. And there are price formulas, hard numbers tied into what you charge other people. You can't, there's no waiver that will allow you to come up with a new price for insurance companies to charge people with pre-existing conditions. There's, there are, there's regulatory structures that, can't, that are immutable as opposed to the Graham-Cassidy. Was that put in the original bill as like a, a giveaway to Republicans saying, hey, if you can figure out a way to do this through the market, then fine, you can take that money. But we don't actually think you're going to be able to do that. So that's no, why no in, one has in done In the it. Affordable Care Act? Yeah. No, it's because... Most states have not figured out a way to do it more efficiently than the exchange. Like at one point, right? Vermont was going to get a waiver to do a single payer system. And they ended up not going for it. But you cannot waive. You cannot waive the requirement that you provide essential health care benefits. That if you sell the product insurance, it must include eight of these essential health care benefits and you cannot deny people who have pre-existing conditions. Oh, what the fuck would you know, Rachel? <laughs> Rick wrote the fucking bill. <laughs> <laughs> you and that broad keep lying about it. It's really fucking irritating. Now, get on the field, you <laughs> sons of bitches. Play the game. Play the game. Play the game. We're going to get to Why that. don't you respect the troops for a change? Who do you think protects you when you're walking around with your hormone-free milk and your other lesbian items you purchase? <laughs> the police. That's why you don't get robbed every day and beaten with your glasses smashed in your freaking Jew face. But no appreciation. None. It, it sounds a little bit like uh, right-wing Mandela has a cold today. I do have a cold because of socialized medicine. <laughs> You're saying that socialized medicine illegal. actually got you, made you sick. Well, if you think of the pathogens that the illegals are bringing across <laughs> the borders and the fact that I cannot get a super laser beam imported directly from Singapore <laughs> because of government bureaucrats, as Greg has so elegantly pointed out, which it's, would mean I would never true. get colds again. If you had you a super a, laser beam. If I had a super laser beam from Singapore, <laughs> why do you oppose this? <laughs> Oh, I forgot, because you worship government. 
I mean, it shows Samantha, whatever the fuck your name is. <laughs> but yeah, go ahead, criticize Rick. He's out on the field doing something. He wrote he's, Graham well, Cassidy he's a, he's before a, Cassidy a, was even in the Senate. He's a lobbyist. I mean, he, yes, he's a fucking lobbyist for open exchange of ideas. I wish somebody would have said, like, wait a second, you what? You wrote it? How how is it that you wrote it? You're a lobbyist. Exactly. Who do you represent? Lobbyist. Who is it your lobbying firm represents that you wrote this? Oh, I don't know. Maybe the health insurance companies, the ones that know how to do the fucking job. <laughs> um, you must have some relatives that work, love it, work in health insurance, don't you, Rachel? <laughs> I don't. They're all, you must. They're all attorneys. Think of all, all yeah, attorneys for who? Think yeah, of all the paperwork that isn't going to get filed. They're, they're that might affect your... Blue Cross Blue Shield. Globe emoji, globe emoji, globe emoji. <laughs> Uh, parens, parens, let me uh, go for it. Uh, you know, it's been a long time since we talked about this guy. Uh, at one time, years ago, in fact, we had a theory that Louis Gohmert was a deep cover Russian spy. As you know, before this was a thing, we before this was add, a thing, this is not no, even this remotely is, this is on anybody's radar. 2014, yes. 2013, there was no Gohmert, meme about this. No, Gomert, uh, in fact, you can look uh, online for us. Uh, we did a couple episodes of the Gomericans. And Gomert um, had uh, come out and admitted that he had spent his youth in the Soviet Union. And we thought that he was a deep, deep cell in the United States, uh, constantly getting updated instructions. And um, here he is, flacking for the president. Makes sense. I mean, it makes total sense. He's coming back. Boris has told him he can come out of the woods. The woods are dark and deep, Louis. <laughs> and so he went on to Fox News to talk about the Senate health care bill holdouts. This guy, as you know, uh, Louis Gohmert is a congressperson and so understands the dynamics in the Senate. And he has a suggestion for one of the premier holdouts, John McCain. Yeah. Oh, he started up again here because we got uh, Steve Douchey is... Uh, of those that said I will repeal if he had said last year what he was going to do right. Kelly Ward would have beat him and Kirkpatrick would have beat him uh, but you know nothing inhibits recovery from cancer like stress I think the Arizona could help him and us recall him let him you know fight successfully to this terrible cancer and let's get somebody in here we'll keep the word he gave last year say that again what are you suggesting pause it pause it i want to go back because the fox news host said would you say that again please i think it's because Ducey was so stunned understand what louis gomert just said He's concerned about John McCain's stress level for his now apparently terminal brain cancer. <laughs> to be recalled, to go through a recall election in Arizona to spare him the stress of being a senator. And he's saying it with a straight face. And Ducey is so flummoxed. He's like, I'm sorry. I just passed out for a minute. Can you please say that again? And here it is. Successfully, this terrible cancer. And let's get somebody in here. We'll keep the word he gave last year. Say that again. What are you suggesting? He'd be recalled? I think it would, yeah, I think it would be very helpful because to of him this. and the country. He's got cancer. It, it's a tough battle. But stress is a real inhibitor toward getting over cancer. So let him go back, deal with the cancer, let Arizona recall him so that we can get somebody that will keep his word from, from last year. I gotta say, um, that's pretty moving. Now I've been critical of John McCain in the past, and I'm sure Louis Gohmert has too, but for him to, um, to be thinking so 
so like a such a like a focus, like a laser focused on John McCain's health in that way. What a what a wonderful, empathetic human being. He I is. have a slightly different read, which is I think that in order to help uh, Senator McCain deal with this uh, really terrifying disease, a sense of per- uh, purpose and activity and a reason to be alive is really what he should be focusing on. So she should stay there and keep... Uh, I don't know. I think there's a lot of stress. You think, I think there's, you a, think lot there's a middle ground there? Yeah, I, think, I, I agree with Gomert. I think we they should recall him just in the interest of John use. McCain. Right. In the <laughs> I'm sure he would find that relaxing. Like, calming you know someone with brain cancer would love like like fifty thousand pack ads saying that they support <laughs> terrorism because <laughs> they voted against health care <laughs> that's just the ticket for an immune boost that is <laughs> maybe they could even bring back up it's like you know what gomert's like maybe we can even bring up some stuff from 2000 about how he's what got a black in, kid or in, something what we are the do people a lot of in stuff. in uh in gomert's um in Gomert's district, who are saying like, "Man, he really hey, what a, what a sincere fella! What a humanitarian Louis Gomert is. He's so sincere. Look at him. Bless his heart. Bless his heart, caring about the stress level of John McCain." What I love though is that Louis Gomert is absolutely one of the dumbest people to ever grace public life. And right there... You though, know who's the second dumbest? <laughs> the, the people who vote for him. Yeah, well, fair enough. But I'm just thinking, like... I, and maybe he's dumb enough to actually be sincere in that. No and way. not be doing... Yeah, no, no he's way. doing... Well, okay, well, that's my point. I don't think he is. And there's one other person who could not even sort of summon that level of subtlety, and that would be Trump. Like, why do I want him to recover? He should just be recalled. <laughs> not so it decreases his stress. But just so he's recalled. <laughs> but I thought it was terrible how we voted. <laughs> he can't even pretend to be concerned about the guy's diagnosis. Do you have the IM on? Uh, oh, I forgot. No, I don't. Getting some frantic tweets. Okay. It's really stressful. Where is I just think he's going to say that, like, you know, I think John McCain put a hex on himself. <laughs> and I think his cancer might disappear if he just did the right thing. Uchi Wally, you should do shows on all the nut job billionaires. You've done Mercer and the Cokes, uh, so you know how to cover them. Richard Mellonscape is dead, but you could still do a show on him, Coors, et cetera. Yeah, that's probably a good point. Dissident Peasant, uh, the real restraint on what society can do isn't how much money it has it's how much capacity it has land material available labor good ideas on what to do the united states has vast swaths of people with creative potential stuck doing bullshit jobs to make ends meet and we're wasting them your humble peasant included stay diffident serfs comrade jeb is it me or does arthur laffer look like right wing jimmy door Mm, something there you guys got to get Greg on the show, uh, laugh out loud, with right-wing Mandela interviewing him. Way better than annoying vampire Peter Thiel character. I would love to hear about laser beams and jetpacks versus beta cuck serfs like Sam who spend all day worshipping the government and global elites. And Greg should do it in a Russian accent. Right-wing rolling R's. Ken Mal. Quist. I've said this before, but it bears repeating. One of the best introductions to MMT is Walter Mosler's Seven Deadly Innocent Frauds of Economic Policy. It's a free ebook. Also recommend getting him on. Yeah, Warren Mosler. Seven Deadly Innocent Frauds. Uh, Root Black Jabber. Oh. Mirt the crop space. We got all these things. Hey guys, I didn't realize how many hard. Oh, this is Greg. How many hardline communists listen to your show? Super hardline. In fact, uh, they've threatened us and put us against the wall. Some of them found me on Twitter and figured they'd pick an argument with me about my tweets, seeing as how I'm presented as a libertarian and all. So I thought I'd respond in good faith. What I encountered is an interesting mix of ideological communism and Maoism. Some serious attempts to discuss an issue and lots and lots of clowning around and show memes to fall back on to congratulate each other. One guy, for example, goes by the name Death Camp for Kulaks, 
whose icon is Stalin and whose profile advocates eradicating all straight white people. I'm not sure how tongue-in-cheek it is because in our conversation he made it clear he doesn't think the Holodomor was that bad compared to capitalists like Zuckerberg. And millions dead is no reason to, tr to not try collectivizing farms again. And he insists that basic income is a tool of the capitalist class to maintain a customer base. However, I replied in good faith, saying that this is like saying single-payer health care is just a tool for the American Medical Association of Doctors to maintain a customer base. I think I made a new friend. He replied with a meme, and that's where it's at at the moment. Well, good luck, you two. I, I hope you find happiness. Attorney Andrew, please tell me you've seen the Business Insider piece on Kushner's lawyer getting fooled into talking to a prankster posing as Kushner. If not, Michael, you need it for tonight's show. I have not seen that. Trademark bullshit. Uh, just the thought of another reason for the government to sell bonds. If they do eventually spend too much because of MMT implementation, it would theoretically show up in a sharp increase in bond yields. I think I have that dynamic right. Chris Lapaco. There's another version of MMT that people don't talk about very much. I work for TIPS, a.k.a. I hope strangers will pay me instead of my employer. In return, I don't work hard or wash my hands after going to to the bathroom. Furthermore, the restaurant can make an unlimited amount of chips and salsa, so I pour as much salsa as I can into a thermos before I leave work. I put chips in a garbage bag, act like I'm taking out the trash, but I walk to my car and drive away more chips than a Pringles factory, a.k.a. pajama party with all-you-can-eat chips and salsa at my place, $5 cover charge, bling bling, motherfuckers. <laughs> calling from a 605 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? 605. Hi, Sam. This is Dylan from South Dakota. It's B uh, Bill or yeah, Phil? Dylan. Dylan. How are you, Dylan? Dylan. What's on? Yeah, What's happening? Me. Well, uh, it used to be the state of George McGovern, not McGovern. However, South Dakota has recently become the state of all lives splatter, which I need to call about. Yes, I remember that lady. Oh, yeah. Which um, I'm not sure which angle she's coming from, because uh, Tommy Lauren happens to be the from the same city as her, and myself and um <clears throat> like she has a lot of videos about black lives matter and whatnot saying that's like not a valid protest so like she might just be watching those and thinking like ah those protesters don't matter or it could be a reaction from the standing rock protests a couple months ago definitely right? a lot of Which, that it's funny to note a couple of years ago she had a, a bill that would test uh welfare recipients from the state and if they were tested positive, their kids would be put into child services, oh, Jesus. which uh, <clears throat> circumvents the Indian Child Welfare Act. Mm, interesting. Uh, yeah, sounds like so a, I'm sounds not sure like which a really nice the lady is coming from, but right. it's probably both. Right. Sounds like a very uh, nice lady. Yeah, people remember yeah, North Dakota. Uh, there were some state legislators that wanted to pass a bill uh, keeping liability from drivers if they hit somebody that was blocking a roadway. Unbelievable. Uh, appreciate the call. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right. Calling from a 509 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Uh, 63220. That's S who I am. 63220? Is that your what yeah, is, dude. Is that your height? Ray gun. Uh, <laughs> height and weight, bro. Six. Is that big enough for you? Uh, wait a second, Ronald Reagan. You're saying that you're six three two twenty. I mean, I've seen like, I feel like I've seen video of you, that's, and I don't believe that's the case. Oh, it's the case. Um, <laughs> first of all, I wanted to say uh, too much BS. Fucking classic, dude. Such a good joke. Uh, lots of jokes <laughs> don't get funnier the more you say them, but this one, it's like every time, dude, gets me. It is. Uh, so keep that up. I, well, it was an I am, I will say, uh, that I was reading. Uh, First off. Second, of, second off, it was also thing. an one homage. More, one more thing. It was please, also, please don't interrupt me. I'm not a woman, but... <laughs> Um, you still are interrupting me, which is, anyways, um, you're a celebrity, 
which is fine, but celebrities tend to surround themselves intentionally or unintentionally with uh, yes people. Um, and I'm just here to uh, try and keep it 100 with you. <laughs> to understand what that means. Um, I, I think I think I think I do. Yes. Okay, so I'm just trying to help you keep it real. And so in the spirit of that, and every celebrity needs one of these people and their entourage to be like, don't go out in that, you look ridiculous or whatever. So I'm fulfilling my role. I saw when I that tell show. You that, uh, Cliff, I saw when that I'm, show. When I tell you that uh, uh, Cliff Schechter really sucks. And um, <laughs> so I know you're friends with him. It's not cool for me to tell you that, but um, he's got this thing about retweeting David Frum and Evan McMullen, and I've tried to bring it to his attention that this is uh, totally unnecessary, and he just, I don't know, he's, he's hashtag resistance, Hillary, you know, I, I don't know. I think that uh, it's time to How give you Lawson a call, say... Say, Gee, what are you up to on Friday mornings? And I'm not saying you got to get rid of them 100%, but you could do a phase out where we aim for like maybe early February. By early February, we're down to like one cliff per quarter. Per quarter? I'm just spitballing here, but right. yeah. Well, I mean, it's an aggressive phase out, <laughs> but uh, you don't need to worry about him hearing this because he doesn't listen to your show. I've been listening for a long time and it's clear. It's clear he misses all the references. He has no idea, never listens to it. And then he comes on your show. Right. Uh, he shills his shitty podcast. <laughs> he's got a, a, a jingle with his website in it. And he's not paying for any of this airtime. This is a one-way relationship. Celebrities also get these latchers on, right? These people that just, oh... I got to get some of that Sam Theater stank on me. Right. And well, that happens. that's what's happening. You'd be what's, surprised. That's what's happening here. That's what's happening here. There are, there are actually, people, you don't, you there are actually see, people who will buy used mouse pads from this program. Like, yeah, literally. Not me, because <laughs> Matthew Film Guy tried to pull some bullshit with his eBay page. But that's another call for another day. Talk about a talk about a barnacle on the SS Cedar. But uh, <laughs> Sam, I just you know I, I think you I think you rotate the Friday guests just like you do with the movie guests, and uh, we have been talking about rotating yeah. the guests for a long time. That is actually a an yeah, well, age all old. All talk, no action. Yes, that's true. All talk, no action. I mean, I think um, I think uh, you know that's. <laughs> That will be taken under advisement. <laughs> okay, serious point, though, about these hashtag resistance people who think that we need Evan McMullen and David Frum to defeat Trump. Making this about Trump is the worst thing you could do because Trump's going to have a heart attack in four months. And at that point, what? Like, we won? It, you know, all of a sudden, Evan McMullen is uh, your look, friend. I agree with David, that. David I Trump is your friend. I agree with that. Hey. I agree I'm with just, that. Okay, I agree I'm just saying. I agree with that. Uh, and I've said I love, so many times. I love you, and thanks for uh, thanks for letting me help you keep it 100. Right. And, uh, okay. and uh, I'll call again uh, thank soon. you okay. so much for your final call to the program. Thank you. That was wonderful. He has a Nathan Fielder sort of. Uh, he does. <laughs> he went in. Um, let's go to trademark bull. Oh, wait, we already did that. <laughs> Denver Dave, in more loyalty news, newly released recordings r reveal that Ivanka and Don Jr. tried to bump Tiffany out of her inheritance. Sam, the avatar tied to my account is build a cat from the comic strip Bloom County. Please tell E. Greg that doesn't necessarily make me a radical leftist cartoonist. See, Michael, watch out for Scott Wagner in PA. He wants to become governor. 
aligning with Steve Bannon and Trump. He will be Kansas, Wisconsin if he does. No budget in PA right now because they won't tax natural gas. Trump, like Merkel, would be a great character. Lauren, hey, guys, people hate Luther Strange because of how he got into the Senate seat. He dropped the investigation into former governor as AG getting into the seat. Ah, yes, yes. Oh. Former Governor Bentley referred to Strange as the most corrupt man in Alabama. We get, we got to get him out of the state. Creamy Dripping Center. MMT's main problem is it lacks a theory of inflation. That's not true. It lacks a theory of monetary inflation, but it doesn't lack a theory of inflation. It believes that inflation is a function of lack of supply or increase in demand. You can always curtail production of money. Bernie is a Pied Piper leading his followers in the direction of an unattainable dream at an immense cost to progress. He wants to use the apparatus the Democratic Party built over years to advance his own agenda, whether it helps the party or not. In some sense, it's like a wasp. As for MMT, it's interesting theory, but it does not really add much more than Keynesian theory. Uh, no, I don't think you understand it. <laughs> Sometimes it's the simple things. It doesn't seem like he is the only one who wants um, to him to use the apparatus of the Democratic Party to advance his own agenda. I don't know what you think is his own agenda is. Um, to take over churches for colleges. It's all for my wife. I want to take over the entire health infrastructure. Seems like a lot of Democrats want him to do that, too. To Epish. But what benefit is for states to refuse federal dollars? Is it just to shrink the regulatory authority of the federal government? I think the right is convinced that boosting federal spending leads to the need for more federal oversight. Then the need for more federal oversight leads to increased federal, federal regulatory authority. And at the base of its increased federal regulatory authority means less power in the hands of the boss. If you want to read about anti-democratic project starving the beast of federal regulatory authority, check out Joseph Scoville's On the Growth of Leviathan from the Acton Institute. Michael Reagan, re Gomert and Ducey. If Kilmeade had been there, there, the stupid level would have reached critical mass and there would have been a stupidity black hole in the shape of Blake Farenthold's gaping mouth, <laughs> sucking all intelligence <laughs> out of the universe. GOP would have just been fine. C. J. Purden. I didn't dodge the draft just so some son of a bitch could take a knee during the national anthem. Bone spurs, hashtag. Uh, DX Fool. Hello, man cavers. Could you get Naomi Klein on to discuss disaster capitalism coming to Puerto Rico with a GOP governor there? I can imagine the island's education system converted to all charter schools and the pharmaceutical industry getting more tax breaks and looser regulations. Don't forget uh, the USVI. Kenny Chesney founded a charity to help territory where he has a vacation home. Yeesh. Um, <laughs> so meanwhile, people have started to um, wonder... Why, with Puerto Rico being such a literal disaster area right now, uh, Donald Trump has spent so much time on criticizing football players. Now, he did, to his credit, tweet out a quick thread on Puerto Rico, which culminated in him saying they really have to pay their debt to bankers. As 60% of the country doesn't have electricity, millions of people don't have potable drinking water, uh, it's an odd set of priorities. But here, to help you understand, is Sarah Huckabee Sanders. This is a significant week, a pivotal week uh, for the president, for Republicans. It's an opportunity, some are saying the last best chance for repealing and replacing Obamacare. And yet much of yesterday, uh, the beginning part of today was focused, uh, as far as the president is concerned, on the NFL, on players who take a knee. Uh, can you explain how that's helpful to that effort of repealing and replacing Obamacare when the president spends so much time on that other issue, the issue involving sports. 
really doesn't take that long to type out 140 characters, and this president's very capable of doing more than one thing at a time and more than one thing in a day. Multi-time. John Gizzi. You see, Sarah, how it's, it's, it's taken up so much oxygen, right? When the president speaks about that particular issue, you see how the majority of questions that have been asked of you so far today have been about this particular well, issue. that's determined he has by a you tremendous, guys. He has a <laughs> tremendous amount of power when he tweets, and we report on it. And so when he tweets something, it does take away from his legislative agenda. Would you not agree? Uh, no, I don't, because I think that it's important for a president to show patriotism, uh, to be a leader on this issue, and he has. There you go. We need a leader on the issue of, of patriotism and football games. I mean, I think it's frankly the guy who's asking that question about health care and frankly even the question uh, un you know, asked uh, earlier in the uh, press conference about Puerto Rico, same basic line of questioning. The answer is in the question. It's because he doesn't want to talk about those other things. It's because he doesn't want to talk about the fact that he can't get the repeal and replace done. And he doesn't care about Puerto Rico. And frankly, I think he's probably worried about signaling to his base that he gives two craps about Puerto Rico. Like, I don't think it's just a matter of him not caring. I think he actively knows that, like, there's a liability if I show any concern for Puerto Rico with my base. I would imagine a lot of his base don't realize that, A, they're Americans. And then, even then, I don't think, why would they care? Why would they care that they're Americans? They have the same problem with brown people who are on the continental United States. You're going to have the same problem with Puerto Ricans. I'll give you the real fucking story on Puerto Rico if you would like it, Rachel. Uh, that would be great. Okay, first of all, no one was going to fucking comment on it until we found out that Steve Mnuchin has some type of bank trust where he will get paid out if they ever pay off their fucking bills. And then number two, health care is not going to pass. So what do you say? You say, you dirty PRs, you pay your bills. Win, win. Win, win. By the way, it's surrounded by a very big ocean. Here's, here's, here's uh, Sarah um, uh, Huckabee Sanders explaining uh, why Trump um, was referring to kneeling players as uh, son of a bitches. To me, to be worth the honor of respect during the national anthem. I understand, all that. I understand General Dempsey's uh, position. I think people would thank him for his service to this great nation. But did the president go too far in referring to these players as SOBs who should be fired? I think that it's always appropriate for the president of the United States to defend our flag, to defend the national anthem, and to defend the men and women who fought and died to defend it. There you have it. There it is, folks. Calling from a 786 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hello? Hello? Hey, hello. Hey, how's it going, guys? It's uh, Tony from Miami. It's been a while. Tony, how are you? What's on your mind? Uh, doing good, man. How's everybody? Um, um, all right, man. I uh, just wanted to say hi. I haven't spoken to you guys since... Uh, the storm, which seemed to have followed me throughout Florida. Oy. Goddamn storm. Did you yeah, do okay? I, uh, the day of the storm, what happened? I mean, are you okay? Or did you, you come out the other yeah, side? Yeah, I'm okay? good. I'm good. Um, yeah, we're good, man. My, uh, we, we, uh, we live down here in Homestead, right? Which is and pretty much right off the ocean, which is, you know, was, which was going to be like ground zero when um, – Irma was supposed to pass through uh, originally. Right. And so we left. We went to a friend's house in Tampa. And then um, the next day, that Saturday morning, they're like, oh, well, it's coming to Tampa. Then we're like, oh, shit. Then, you know, from there, I uh, went to my aunt's house in Kissimmee. And then that fucking night, it said that, <laughs> hey. that the Irma was passing through Kissimmee. So that weekend for me was just a headache. Uh, and then I had my, my one-and-a-half-year-old daughter with me. So that was the main reason why I was just trying to get away from the storm. Jeez. And uh, I just wanted to call and say, you know, uh, 
thank you to uh, a listener uh, that you have who uh, was actually reaching out uh, to me on Twitter uh, throughout that week and that weekend, just checking in and stuff. Uh, oh, cool. Uh, the name of Jen Ritchie. She was a true trooper looking out for a friend out here in uh, Miami and stuff. I'd like to thank her and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, I just also wanted to mention I was watching the debate with uh, Bernie Sanders and, and uh, Cassidy and Graham and stuff. And um, I think um, with the representative Amy, even though her presence there was a little meek or mute or whatnot, I think actually her introduction at first of her bringing up a personal story, I think was probably the strongest point. It probably helped out, I think, Bernie hmm. uh, right in the beginning. Um, because, A, um, uh, we're a lot of us supporters, uh, we may not say it or just on any spectrum. Um, our first uh, reactions usually toward things are emotional ones, uh -oh. right? So her coming out, introducing herself, and then the first thing really she says was that her daughter had a problem. Right. And then at the end of the problem, she went and she went to the state and she fixed it with a legislation that she helped, you know, make and pass. Uh, and then saying that, you know, she's, you know, wasn't really even saying she wasn't against Medicare for all. I don't even remember her mentioning anything as far as like not siding with it. She right. really just wants to work something out. Yep. So I think her kind of like non-approval approval kind of did make a point for Bernie. And even though uh, Graham was trying to reach out with his, uh, well, I believe in climate change. Let's stop talking <laughs> right. about it and do something about it. I mean, what's the <laughs> job? Let's just do it sooner. Let me take away your health care. And then we could worry about climate change because then you won't have health care. And we'll all die together. So, I mean. That's, uh, that's a pretty dynamite <laughs> grammar uh, question right there. <laughs> I like that a lot. I it's try. Good. I really try. Well, I think that's a good I point. Really that, I mean, do. he was clearly trying to say, like, I'm not a lunatic. And so let me now try and sell mm -hmm. you this lunacy that is Graham Cassidy. Uh, great point. I'm glad. Thank, thank you. you for that. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you for that story, too, about um, somebody reaching out to you. That's nice. I'm glad you no, said it's all good. Thank you. Thank her. And stuff. Oh, man. I'm glad. MR also, man. The only thing that happened was uh, my fence being knocked down. All good. But thanks a lot for listening, guys. All right. Appreciate the call. We got to make sure we got to work on your uh, your mic craft. We got to work out because that's what popping. You Sometimes you get you pop. I don't know about. Time. All right. Laura. Uh, Buttery Males. You should look at having on Kurt Anderson. He's the author of Fantasyland. He detailed the early history of the United States and the type of people that made up our, early, our country's early DNA. He does a great job explaining why people here uh, especially believe bullshit so willingly. Yeah, he wrote a, a piece, I think, based on that book. I always wanted to... I, I, I read... Um, what was the book he wrote, like, in 99... I can't remember what it was, but I thought they captured that time amazingly. Uh. Colin Ducet, right-wing media. We're not giving aid to Puerto Rico, uh, not because they're brown, but because they're an island of four is at best. Globe emoji, globe emoji, globe emoji. <laughs> Lewis from Texas. Bernie made Lindsay look a little beta male pajama boy getting cucked for the first time and finding out it's not so as pleasurable as he imagined. Rick, my parents live in Louis' district. Yes, they're all dumb. <laughs> uh, Bone Dog. Can you discuss universal basic income? What are your thoughts? Um, we've talked about it in the past. I mean, I have, uh, you know, broadly speaking, I don't think it's a, a bad idea. I just think that you have to, um, if you uh, introduce it, it's got to, you, you got to make sure it's not coming in in lieu of other um, programs. Calling from a 605 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Yeah, this is Malik, and I'm calling from Minnesota. What's on your mind, Malik? I got two quick things. One, um, I just wanted to ask you guys what you thought about kind of the defense of the ACA, um, because I don't see Democrats mentioning in particular that 
Republican governors refuse to expand Medicaid. So you've got millions of people who would otherwise be eligible for health care and that then would pull those people also out of the individual market, which could affect that. And I'm not I'm not an expert, so I have no idea if that would lower premium substantially. But I have to think that it would have a pretty major effect. I don't know. To be honest with you, the affordable. The, I don't know a lot, a lot of, of those people. Of affordable Care Act would be helped. I don't know that a lot of those people are in the individual market, to be honest with you. I think they just don't have coverage. Now, it would it would lower the cost of health care uh, insofar as you wouldn't have people going into emergency rooms. You know, for instance, I went to an emergency room um, a, a while back. It cost me. All I had was an EKG and a blood test. I was there for seven hours. It cost me, I was billed over $2,500, okay? Now, if you go in there because you actually have something significantly wrong uh, with you that could have been prevented by some type of regular care, it drives up the cost of, of, of care significantly, which then implicates health insurance. But I don't think there's a lot of people who are not getting Medicaid who are entering into the, um, the individual market. I don't, I don't think they have enough money. I just don't think they can afford it. They're going to the emergency room, you know, and they're only doing it after they're super sick. So that's, that's where the implication is for the cost. I have a, you know, I think the reason why the Democrats don't and you, you're right. They don't explicitly remind people. They're not leading with the idea that uh, Republican governors have rejected Medicaid because I just don't know who is compelled by that, frankly, at this point. If you don't know that at this point, like who's that going to convince in this argument? Uh, because you're basically talking about people who are not the people to a large extent, who are engaging in the debate. You know what I mean? I just, I think that it, yeah, I, I yeah. think that's I mean, why they're doing that. But I don't think, I don't think there has. I, I, I just think that's one of the more egregious, like, without a doubt, practices, you know, that literally millions of people could have access and don't. And you no know, what, what, and you know what the answer would be from the Republicans? We're giving them the money. They are literally transferring money from states that expanded Medicaid. And in the first 10 years, they're actually transferring it to states that didn't expand Medicaid. Well, right. That's exactly the point that I'm saying, though, why Democrats need to remind people that the Republican governors are the reason that they, in states like Oklahoma or Nebraska or South Dakota, that's why they don't have access to more options. And then the Republicans would say, well, they didn't want that because they, did, they didn't have the flexibility. Uh, I mean, yeah, yeah. No, I, I just I just think that 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 defense should be there. But I, I, I take your point. I did want to mention one quick thing, because I know you guys are always short on time. Um, I, I read Tim Snyder's book. I would encourage listeners to do that um, and get engaged with a local campaign. Uh, I just found a guy on Twitter who's running for the Democratic Party. He's a progressive. I mean, I literally emailed him and was able to start volunteering for the campaign. Now is the time to start engaging um, local candidates for 2018. You can't wait until November 2018. Yeah, um, It's very easy. Go knock doors, go get yard signs, do all the little stuff like that. Um, this guy ran in my district in Minnesota, 14B, uh, which is one of the most heavily contested districts or uh, the most money spent in a house district in Minnesota. Right. Um and he lost by 147 votes in 2016, which is three votes per precinct. Wow. So there's opportunities out there for your local candidates. People who vote for a local candidate uh, will trickle up to vote for those other candidates. So just would encourage your listeners to do that. And then if any of them want to kick 50 bucks, uh, dan4mn.com uh, to support uh, Dan Wilgo. So, Th- thanks for the thanks, call, Thanks, guys. Mike. I appreciate it. Long-time listener. Um, and, uh, yeah, have a good one. Thanks for calling, Mike. Check the uh, uh, items folks, real quick, or, or I could just now, tell you. I, I see it. Um, you you saw that tweet? Yes, Dana okay. Bash of CNN is now tweeting slash reporting at well, this is at eleven oh one a.m. So this is a couple hours ago. 
Republican sources, Senate Majority Leader and GOP senators agreeing inside lunch now not to vote on Graham Cassidy. It's officially dead. For now. I mean. For now. For now. But I want to keep reiterating, especially if you live in Maine, call and thank her. It's also, and let me also McCain. say this. Yes. Let me also just say this. It's never, it's not dead if it can come back. Because we don't have, you know, it's just like, it's, they've put, they've put it on hold. They're going to keep bringing it up. And the reason why they're going to keep bringing it up is because their donors have told them they want to keep trying. Calling. And, you know, there's a fascinating piece about this in Vox. Where the theory is like, why do the donors desperately want it so bad? Some of them, it's very ideological. The other is, you just got extremely, extremely, extremely wealthy people. Who, I mean, it's, it really is like trading places. Did you see that movie? Of course. You saw that movie, Matt? It's a classic. Yeah. I think it's just like, we got a ton of cash to put into this. I'll I wanna, make a bet with you, no, Mortimer. <laughs> I, I want to win. Oh, completely. I want to win. I've decided this is right. It's not going to affect me in any way. I just want I want to be the guy. Yes. Who did this? Sick. All right. One more call. Call from a 703 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is Anthony Scaramucci with an outdated character reference. There you go. Anthony. How's it going? From Virginia, although I was a native born son of New York City. There you go. Living in Virginia right now. What'd you say? There you go. What do you got? Well, um, I didn't get a chance to hear most of your discussion with your guests about uh, monetary policy. I'll have to uh, watch the uh, playback when it comes out on YouTube. But what amazes me, I went to, uh, Ma I went to St. John's University and I went to George Mason and I majored in economics. And one thing that kind of continuously blows my mind is the ability of, you know, politicians, both, both of the right and the left, to raise this non-issue of, you know, all oh, the debt, the debt is so large, oh, the interest payments on our debt, oh, the outstanding currency owned by foreign countries, like, it, it's amazing, the debt, the national debt is this, arti okay, it's not an artificial construct, but in practical terms, you know, who's, what other country is going to be, the, what's, what's, what's oil denoted in? What's the currency oil is denoted in? The lifeblood of the world economy, dollars. What's well, going to be the reserve currency of the world for the next 50 years, assuming China can even maintain a rate of growth at 8.5%? Well, this States, is the argument the I have dollar. all the time because there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people who say, like, China, they're trying to make their, uh, they're trying to make their currency the uh, currency. And I'm like, well, yeah, but they have a lot of obstacles. I mean, even if you were to put yeah. aside the, the, the challenges they have in terms of, like, water, in terms of an aging population, the, in terms of maintaining their growth, I mean, all of the problems yeah. that a country of that size is going to have, they also have this huge barrier to entry into a large portion of the world because, you know, for better or worse, the vast majority of the country, of the world, I should say, speaks English as a second or third language. Yeah. The number of people who there speak Chinese is just not that many. You know, you've got people who <laughs> learn Chinese in this country to deal with China, but a lot more of them are learning English to deal with us. And so just in, in, yeah, in yeah, and of it, itself, that is a huge, huge obstacle, uh, it seems to me. Yeah, and it, it just what, but to, build, to build into my final point here, um, you know, I, I, I anticipate maybe in like three, four years, I'm going to be making a run for office. I'm going to be trying to do the patriotic thing, you know, civil engagement, yada, yada, so on and so forth. So be and uh, I've been thinking here. about it and talking with uh, a number of people I work with, you know, members of my family, because, you know, the whole dinner table discussions about politics, that's something that, you know, we've done in my house since, you know, I've been old enough to pronounce the word politics. But I'm here's and just hear me out here and then I just want your brief opinion on it. Imagine an infrastructure campaign like Eisenhower pulled in the 50s. You know, we're going to build these highways. Why? Well, primarily, 
we're going to build them because we need a tank division on the East Coast to be able to be on the West Coast to respond to a Soviet invasion. Now, it was couched in defense, but in terms of economic growth, that infrastructure campaign delivered, you know, look at us now. So what I'm saying is this, the same way that we built a physical infrastructure, now let's build data infrastructure. You know, 10 to $15 billion is all you really need to deliver high-speed internet access to 80% of the country's population. And, you know, one of the knock-on effects is you totally kill telecom companies, you know, like Verizon, AT&T, Comcast. Right, right. So that's, that's the ancillary benefit. You know, and it's funny, I went to school for economics, but I've worked in IT since, ever since I graduated. And every time I hear, you know, like, jobs, jobs, not enough jobs, you know, there's, after working in IT for about the last four years, I can tell you, you know, there are people, I want to hire people to work in, in my field. I want to find more people to work those 10-hour shifts starting, you know, at 2 a.m. at night and ending at noon the next day. I, I need these people, but it, it's amazing that for all of the hype and all of the political capital we throw towards, you know, well, well what about trade schools? You know, we need more mechanics, plumbers, and that's true, but there's this entire other section of the economy that's been largely ignored um, by our political class. And it's just, it's astounding because there's so much growth. You know, I have a girlfriend, she lives in North Carolina. You're in North Carolina. All right, well, listen, listen, I actually, I do actually have to go because I got, uh, I got to record something. I mean, I, it, it's an interesting okay, idea. Okay, well, if you want to cut me off, uh, you guys just... Uh, real quick, in, real, yeah, real, 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 real well, quick. Would you like to share any, like, Jew jokes or anything before you jump off? <laughs> just say that for the... <laughs> well, uh, keep Michael, you, from you know, the See, there you go. Of yeah. comedy. All right. You need to work Love on these guys. messages. All right, appreciate the call. Thanks, man. Um, it's an idea. I mean, I certainly, you know, uh, there was an attempt in the stimulus to add uh, a bunch of money, particularly for rural high speed. And there's been a lot of talk that has been crushed, both at a local level of like, you know, WiMAX. I was told five or six years ago, man, it's coming. It's coming. And it just sort of disappeared from the. Two thirty. Yeah, I got to get going. Got to get out of here. Um, all right. I'm sorry, folks. Don't have uh, time for any more calls. I'll take Four more IMs. Newberman, I have a question, Sam. MMT only applies to countries which control their own currency. Indeed, yes. So the same logic around taxation and deficits don't apply to countries in the Eurozone. Exactly. Countries, uh, people arguing for better health care. Look to, exactly. Exactly. Well, it doesn't, the same logic around taxation and deficits doesn't apply to countries in the Eurozone, countries people arguing for better health care look to. There's no relationship between those two things. Um, but if you're saying that even there, they don't have to, um, uh, they have more constraints about what they can afford than here, then yes. Of Jared. Started reading Grandpa Simpson stories in place of IMs from Greg. No one would notice. And the final IM of the day. Oh, that's too hot, too. Thames Darwin, I was hoping to hear our a right-wing Mandela to shut up because he's never been an entrepreneur or job creator, only to realize that, in fact, Samantha is both. Yes. Well, uh, maybe I'll tell him next time I see him. All right, folks. Michael will be here tomorrow. Don't forget... Um, uh, TMBS tonight. Bye bye. It might take all the strength I got to get oh, yeah. to where I want, but I know somehow I'm gonna get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught between the truth and the light bar. But finding out won't make me feel any better. Yeah, I know the clock is ticking, but the meds are gonna kick in, and my pilot light shining bright. I guess I'm where the choice was made, for the option where you don't get paid, for the road.
breaks you I get some 